And welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I am the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Emerging Trends in Data Jobs. This is uh, the March edition in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken, brought to you in partnership with Data Blueprint. Now, I'll give the floor to Megan Jacobs, the webinar organizer from Data Blueprint, to introduce our speakers and today's webinar. Megan. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Megan Jacobs, and I'm the webinar coordinator here at Data Blueprint. Uh, we are pleased that you found the time uh, to join us for today's webinar on emerging trends in data jobs. As always, a big thank you goes out to Shannon and Dataversity for hosting us. I'll start in just a few moments after I let you know about some housekeeping items and introduce your presenters. Uh, we have one hour for the presentation followed by 30 minutes of Q&A. I'll try to answer as many questions as time allows, but feel free to submit questions as they come up throughout the session. And to answer the top two most commonly asked questions, yes, you will receive an email with links to download today's materials, any other information you request during the session within the next two business days. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We have the hashtag DataEd on Twitter, so if you're logged on, feel free to use it in your tweets. Submit your questions and comments that way. Uh, keep an eye on the Twitter feed, and we'll include answers to those questions in our post-session email. I'll introduce you to our presenter, and Peter will be presenting our special guest for today. Uh, Peter Aiken is an internationally recognized data management thought leader. Many of you already know him or have seen him at conferences worldwide. He has been 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions to the profession. Uh, Peter is also the founding director of Data Blueprint. He has dozens of articles and eight books. Uh, the most recent is Monetizing Data Management. And Peter, you're just off a plane, so where are you coming from today? Yeah, kind of ripe off of a red eye coming back from uh, San Diego where we had uh, a group that we were working with out there. So welcome, everybody. Uh, this is a really fun opportunity. Uh, I get to work with two of my favorite people in the world. Let me introduce, first of all, Eva Smith who I've known for at least 10 years at this point. Eva is located up in Seattle, Washington. Uh, she is working with Edmonds Community College and in particular supervising a grant that is focused on how to help people get more into these careers. And she's going to talk to us about some of the career, uh, well, some of the success that she's had with that grant uh, on this. So Eva, welcome. Thank you for taking the time on this one. Oh, Ron. Eva. And Mehmet Oran is Director of uh, Sales Solutions for Salesforce.com. And uh, he, he is a, uh, first of all, phenomenal stylist and dancer, but uh, he ran a data management group at Genentech before this, and we've had lots and lots of conversations around these areas. And um, really just being able to pull all together and, and to work with us is great. And Megan, before I let you go on this as well, thank you for two years of excellent service at Data Blueprint. Uh, this is not goodbye, but uh, again, congratulations on your two-year anniversary with us as well. Thanks, Peter. Uh, so, so what you're seeing here are the sort of general foci that we have to bring to this. And Eva, I'll just turn it over to you for a quick second and let you articulate a bit on this, and then I'll turn it over to Mamet, and then we'll dive in. So, um, basically, we um, we working on the uh, data profession so hot. And um, we're here talking about how do we enable intentional development of um, potential people who are interested in getting into this career, but also once you're in the career, how do you, do, how do you progress through this career? And this is something that um, we've been talking about quite a while in data management. And so, uh, we'll turn it, turn it over to Mehmet to talk about a little bit um, more why is the data profession hot. Um, you know, on this has been, as a consultant, as a professional, I had a chance to work with many, many individuals. Personal development and career development are both parts of mine. And, um, I always, you know, thought after the ways of better supporting people, getting people in and out of the data profession to understand what is it that we do and how to do it better. And through this brainstorming, both with Eva and Peter, we noticed that we have uh, complementary points of view that come from 
fairly different points of origin and for to being a part of the conversation today. Thanks again for joining us on this. I've been concerned really for the last 10, 15 years about raising the profile of the within organizations. And you'll see on the slide here, I, I like to call it our sole non-depletable, non-degrading, durable strategic asset within organizations. And if that's the case, we really do need to play around with it and focus particularly in this area. So this is a, a slide that we kind of put together to talk a little bit about what we're trying to get into. So you can see sort of three different perspectives. And Eva, particularly, congratulations on getting a grant in that area because it's been hard to get the governing organizations to look at this. It's really much of a case of they don't know what they don't know uh, in this. Eva, did you want to talk a little bit about this? Well, you know, as I mentioned, you know, I work in um, education and, or have been working in education. I've been in management 20 years or more, but recently, in um, 10 years in education, we work at community colleges in particular. We have, have people who are coming in from mid-career um, points of view and changing jobs and um, or even younger people who are interested in moving into these kinds of careers. And so we have... Um, we're consistently asking ourselves, how do we um, organize information and programs around um, preparing people for work in the field? And some of the areas that um, we look at are, you know, basic level positions, but also what happens when you get into mid-career positions and how do you actually get into this? And we're talking about um, how do you actually people falling into this career, how do we work through these different titles and roles and their scopes and, um, and different programs. Did you add anything on this one? No, uh, so one of the things we are hoping you're going to get out of this is reasonable frameworks you can have for yourself or for your organizations, depending on you know what role you play. Uh, what is about developing people in particular skill sets, through a given role, switching roles, getting into the field, and you know, hopefully these you know four um, symbols will serve as placeholders if you go through it. The key you can see here is that there's a, a concept around working with data, uh, and again, sort of duties and tools that are there. One of the, the graphics on this chart that might not be familiar to some of you, though, is the circle in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. This is what we've called for years and years the Dema Dimbach wheel. And what we now have is a codification, if you will, whereas before the year really 2009, when you talked about data management, it was very difficult for people to conceptualize it. So lots more on, on that particular uh, topic that we could get into it, maybe in the Q&A section. But Matt, I think you were really looking to hit this particular question on it as well, which is why is the data, what is the data profession and why is it so hot? You know, some a pretty strong interest in the session, and I think one of the reasons for it is you know, they're not just being talked about in the you know back of IT departments anymore. You know, business Review and some of the well-published business journals have all been writing about data and big data and the idea of the data scientist, the next you know big thing. We look at the data profession, however, uh, data profession is hot in general. If you have experience. Understanding data, making best use of data, making designs that is going to take advantage of data. All these roles are being really sought after, and there is a thirst in how people can get additional skills and abilities to perform these jobs better. And the uh, scientist is one of the newest titles or roles that is emerging. My hypothesis to you is it is not the only hot field. Now, thinking about the data world is it's still not that well understood. In fact, if we were to look at the definition of what you know, a scientist is, since that is where it most it appears to be. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Now, some common you know definitions that I was able to pull up you know online, where a scientist 
is just someone that focuses on research. Uh, engineer is someone that focuses on taking research, academic principles, best practices, and turning things into something that can work. Knowledge worker in the field of data is someone that uses the information. To take a historical example, when the telegraph was put in place, it took linguists to let word patterns to come up with the alphabet. It took mathematicians to figure out how lines can be transmitted. It took engineers to make device work. And it took uh, people observing telegram operators in order for the information to be transmitted correctly and then the equivalent of economists to figure out how to monetize it or not monetize it, which is why the technology evolved. Now look at data analyst on the other side. Looking at the insight I put other definitions from, data analyst is described as a much more comprehensive role, as if it's the person that can do everything. And in reality, this I would give much more of a description of the data professional and profession is composed of many, many other types of roles. We look at it in the context of IT and how some of the IT roles may relate to each other. We can look at this as a spectrum of entry-level roles evolving into more senior roles. Um, in starting this field, and if you think about your typical you know, IT project, whether is for reporting, whether it is for integration, application development, you know, combination of people in a business analyst, data analyst, developer type of roles. Um, if you think about what an IT department does in general, you also have people like support specialists that actually talk to end users of applications more than most developers you know, ever would. So they have a better sense of the type of you know, information that may be needed or how information may need to be presented. So when you look at the career paths, and we'll get into the these in a much deeper level of scale, uh, I believe there's a natural progression people can evolve into as they evolve in their you know, career or as they their personal experience or education, they can go. Uh, so with that, I uh, will follow the cues of the slides. Uh, you know, let's talk about how once you decide that you want to be in the data profession and you understand there are different roles, uh, what different ways you can get into the field. And Eva, who's the educator of our set of three, uh, is going to take the lead in this area. So uh, my question is, how does someone actually get into this profession? Um, and that's one of the questions that I get constantly from people who are um, mid-career changers or students um, because how to get into this thing. So one of the issues that um, we look at is how do we actually, what are the, the women and what are the different attributes related to this? So one of the things that <laughs> Peter, you have another profession or another <laughs> as well. Exactly. I just I'm really interested in the stability and how do we once we take the good work that you've done, and you know this from working. And we should point out not only is Eva in the educational world, but she's also been a practicing professional for a long time as well. So she's well qualified to comment on this. But when we look at this, we've also got to go back to the college. Uh, and university accreditation bodies and tell these folks that this stuff is important. Because now we have a case that they don't know what they don't know. The answers that I get from data management professionals when I've asked my colleagues in this field is how do I get into this career? Um, you know, it's very, you know, one of the, I just, I just fell into this role is pretty much the common thing. Um, an opportunity came along in my company. Um, another data professional that I knew, um, hey, said, come on in, I'm, you'd be great in this field, entered me. Um, some people, a lot of us have found the Data Management Association or other professional association and, 
and found a home there and said, oh, yeah, I love this stuff. Um, or I, I took a class and, um, you know, for the folks that are in IT, um, they also had, you know, guys that it is important and really um, wanted to make a difference in this area and began to try to find a way to improve the quality of data and um, the use of data in organizations. What's not so typical and, um, is nobody's talking about this uh, in uh, high school. <laughs> nobody's really talking about it in college in, in terms of a profession. Most college programs have a database design class or um, some class on database theory. Um, and those are in computer science, some of the business programs as well. And not that many degrees. And as we'll talk about in a bit, that, that is changed. There's not that many college degrees there in data management um, specifically. So and um, early on, and when we were looking at building curriculums at Edmonds, um, we took a look at the Department of Labor Occupational Handbook, which is where most career counselors in high school and college send students to look for the types of jobs they might be interested in. And to add a point to that, Eva, if the federal government doesn't measure it or keep track of it, it it probably doesn't exist in a lot of people's minds. So very important <laughs> point that we put things in place there. That That is absolutely true. And in fact, um, what we also found in working with in college, the college environment is that for those that are relying on financial aid, um, for those that are reliant, who are have been laid off and are getting worker retraining money, they look at those kinds of um, kinds of uh, government um, publications as ways to identify high demand areas to fund whether or not somebody is qualified for funding for certain types of programs. So the other part of this is that you know, um, over the past 10, 10 to 12 years in data management association, we're try, trying to take a look at the elusive um, data management career. This, there was some work done a while back in um, 2006 on a survey at, a, at an EDW conference uh, with Paragraph about um, what is a typical data pro professional. Then, in 2006, um, the professional was approximately 45 years old, had um, you know, 20 years of experience, and typically began this in the mid-20s. Um, so it really it really became clear that this is something that occurs partway through somebody's career, mid-career, and requires quite a bit of experience. And in recent studies, however, um, and in recent uh, um, publications, much more interest in this area. 2013, the demographics um, began to change, and a lot of that is because of the Big Death Conference. Um, and a lot of attention on big data. Uh, even in academia, we're hearing a lot about big data. And so um, this sort of fueled more interest in this field. And so I'd like you to take a look at the letter on the left because, you know, the things that we um, often sort of compel to are the um, professions. So lawyer, for example, is, um, you, you train for throughout your college career, and there's a there's definitely a path for it. And computer designer, you know, is an example. You train for your career, and there's a path for it. So colleges can develop programs around that. For us, it's been difficult because there isn't a a clear path, and so there's kind of a gap there in between the time that you graduate from college and the time you actually get into some sort of a a day career. So, the next slide. <laughs> so, our problem has been classification. And in data management, we know a lot about classification. But we get those classifications when we're thinking about what we want to do in our careers.
of course, people aren't coming to career fairs and things and asking IT departments to put them in as data professionals because the IT departments don't recognize it as a career, and consequently it's a chicken and egg situation. The yeah. Uh, yeah. The other aspect of it is I think the frequency is notions. So for those of you on the phone that have young daughters, uh, the last picture may be much more familiar to those of you that do not. Uh, Mira was one of the first non-typical Disney princesses because she actually, you know, wielded weapons and made her own decisions and pushed back on it. So she challenged the idea of what a princess is or is supposed is not supposed to be. Similar, I think we talk about what a data professional is or is not supposed to be. And we strive to understand the meaning of titles. We strive to understand the meaning of words. But statistics do matter in human communication. And if we think, uh, for example, a data modeler is someone that is going to take six months to up with uh, tech designs that we are never going to implement. And I throw in some words that sometimes can have negative connotations in that sentence on purpose. It's not going to evolve as much. So part of what we are trying to do is, is total roles in order to enable individuals to be as effective as possible in the organization, to, and that they are going to be able to have the right set of skills and the right set of abilities. Uh, the other part is recognize that while these are roles that are you know, broadly defined in their nature, people may be having different business titles either their broader responsibilities or nature of the culture that they are a part of. Uh, what T you're going to see is while we have these titles, uh, as Eva mentioned earlier, they are not reflected by the government managed long life cycle taxonomies either. I'm add on to that as well. Another challenge that we have is we have varying sizes and shapes of IT departments. So a smaller IT department is much more likely to have a blended sort of an approach than a very large IT department that may have very specialized components in it. So you know, as a data person, what I would say is we need to differentiate what a role is supposed to do and what title may mean. They are related but different things. So, and Eva, you alluded earlier that there are some challenges with the uh, U.S. federal government's classification of the profession, even though it's evolving. Yeah, so, uh, like I mentioned, uh, early in the 2000s, we talked about the um, looking at programs at Edmonds in particular, looking at developing a program in data management, and looking at what the different rules and types were out there. And back then, really only a few, everything was classified into database administrators and computer systems analysts. So it was really sort of difficult and still is sometimes to explain to people what a data management professional is. Um, so the Data Management Association actually um, did begin to work with Department of Labor to look at some of those roles. And now, Today, this, this is a snapshot from the ONET online. You can get data, database architects, critical data managers, data warehouse specialists, um, business intelligence analysts are showing up as categories within the ONET. And um, as you can see, data arch database architects have a bright uh, outlook, which is um, which from perspective of, of the uh, folks filling out the financial aid, that's what they look for when students ask to be in the kinds of professional. Um, so we're actually beginning to make some progress in this area. Um, and the you know, sense of that is, uh, is, is part of, of, I think, in the profession to try to help understand. And we have quite a ways to go. Um, as you can see, this is the directly from the ONET. Um, this represents not for which data collection is underway. They are still in the process of identifying what database architects are. Um, but you can see there's a reasonable definition for that now. 
And, and the other part of this is that if it's not there, it's not going to happen, and yet we don't have a professional we have a volunteer group that's doing this. And again, Eva, you put in a lot of your time and effort to make sure that happened. So we now have to start, and we need to carry on. Correct. So we're actually looking at, and this is one of the things that, um, as Peter mentioned, um, and recently we see grants to put in place um, actually certification programs that are self-paced and online. And um, there are IT programs, but one of the programs um, is, uh, is data focused. And um, as part of this, we brought in a, a group of, of um, and working in the field in a focus group to talk about skill, knowledge, and abilities of each of these different areas in IT and, and in data management. But it, in the data management one, we collect some information. This, one of the questions that we asked the focus group attendees was, what are the preferred attributes that are required of a typical data management professional? And you can see the ones that jumped out, um, these are the abilities that somebody Somebody who would be good in this profession, who typically works in this profession, would be likely to, be likely to make them successful. So uh, you can see that can the big picture is important. Um, organization skills, communication skills were ones that popped out as important. And then along and also talked about the knowledge areas that would be necessary for. Um, somebody works in this field. And um, those areas um, were very aligned with the data um, management by knowledge as well. Modeling concepts, technical data structures, um, principles and framework were all areas that, um, that came out as a uh, knowledge that somebody in this area would need to have. And if we're continually asking those questions, um, how does one get that knowledge <laughs> as well? We also looked at skills. These are things that people need to be able to do um, in order to be successful in the types of things that they do in their work. So um, organization and planning was pretty uh, consistently across um, all of the professions in tools, um, and those could be a variety of different tools, um, and one of the things we talked about quite a bit in this focus group was um, facilitation, communication, modeling skills came as high areas of, um, that cross all areas of data management jobs. And then we bring all of this together into what a, a typical work profile would be. Now, it's really important that the work pro that we understand in terms of developing training programs or um, sort of different types of programs that we understand what a, the typical work is for these types of, of roles. So, um, and these are the tasks that came out, project management, data modeling, um, data analysis. Now, I also want to point out that this is not a scientific study. This is just, um, you know, talking within a facilitated session with um, some of the data management professionals in the CL area. So it, uh, but it did give us quite a bit of information to start with, and it also again aligned very closely with the work that we've done with um, within DEMA with the data management body of knowledge and the certifications that the CDNC certification. We mentioned this before. Again, the, the DIMBOC had not existed prior to 2009, so it was difficult when we talked to people for the, us to point to anything to read, which is generally one of the first things they, they look to. So you can see here we derived it and modeled it after the PIMBOC for project management, the BA BOC for business analysis, there's a SWE BOC for software uh, analysis, there's an EA BOC, and there is a DM BOC. Interesting thing, too, Peter, is that. Um, as we went through the um, discussions in this focus group, it was pretty clear that, that management crosses all those domains and intersects in many ways. So um, we are actually 
in order to work in this and progress through this, we people know these other boxes as well. So, Pat, uh, how exactly. do we get <laughs> and really, Mehmet, you know, he stood from a career perspective, but also he's very interested as a professional manager within Salesforce.com to make sure he's got people who can build that company and continue to grow the the really interesting things that Salesforce has been doing at this point. Before getting into the details, this is now I actually want to tell a story, uh, a real story about that may resonate with most of you listening, uh, whether a manager or an individual contributor. A um, number of months ago, um, it got me going on some of the details you're going to see uh, in the next few slides is an individual contributor who was an incredibly effective data analyst. And given the type of people I managed in my past, I had a good sense of I uh, that I want to be able to make a case for them to be promoted. At the time, I am also managing individuals, and you know they want to know how am I doing and what do I need to be at the next level. And my management philosophy has always been, you know, we should always through, uh, help develop you to be able to perform at the next level. And if you can, then we can make an effective case uh, of making the sledge adjustment reflect the nature of the work that you do. The challenge with that approach is, well, you need to have a clearly enough defined criteria for to demonstrate what they can do. And uh, it is not how many languages you know. It's not even how many um, if you have been in a given field. Uh, this field is as arbitrary as trying to estimate code complexity by the number of lines of code versus how well something may actually be written and how flexible, how well performing. Started going down the path, uh, I started working with the organization also on how to define career paths for the more well defined roles in our field. Look at the type of which they're supposed to have, the type of skills they need to have, and the attributes they need to display in the way they work. And just to tell you how the stories ended, we put together uh, career ladders for the data analyst as a role. I'm working uh, on the steward and data architecture tracks also. I uh, got some good, back, good feedback from the international board members as well as our HR. Her department absolutely loved it. Roll out to other managers that you know lead data professionals and uh, use the material to coach other individuals on what they want to do in their career in general, even if they just wanted to get into the data analyst role. So the notes are based on real corporate implementations, and I hope they would help you also. So yeah. understanding the role. And then we'll get into understanding the expectations and how they will evolve over time. Peter, what's the next one? Got it. So the first was making sure people understood what a data analyst is supposed to do, what a data analyst is supposed to be. Uh, we want to start with a common definition and also say that while there are common academic backgrounds that drive people to this, there are many other academic backgrounds that people can get trained because they are passionate about data, they understand still trends, they want the project that future possibilities and in order to come up with this. Then we said, okay, once we have a common definition of what the analyst is supposed to do in general, Let's understand what we can expect given there are different levels of experience and there are different needs for different levels of experience in a field. Uh, can we go? Great. Um, look at it, especially if you have large organizations, uh, you're going to need to have people that are very good at 
critical operational work to make sure things that are supposed to happen happen and being able to perform some rapid analysis of what is taking place. Um, you're not going to see a lot of Harvard Business Review being written on the effect of you know, operation analysts in the organization, making sure there are no breaches, et cetera, however they are essential and then also be an incredible wealth of, you know, human for people to develop, in, develop into for the higher levels. Uh, we are ha having a lot of conversations, however, on, on, you know, what the data analyst can or cannot be for a company. An ideal you may catch is, uh, yes, I'm absolutely classified the scientist as a data role because the near levels you're in, as you can read in these descriptions, the more you're expected to come up with hypotheses in order to fulfill part of end results for the organization. It is very much what a scientist does. And scientists in earlier career also start often as a lab technician understanding how to conduct experiments, how to do measurements, focused on making sure that their measurements are in fact going to be accurate, precise, repeatable, and they get to higher levels of, you know, this approach, project accountability, the more seasons they get. Now, to continue the aspect, if you understand the role, if you understand the expectation from one level, then it's really important to know what are the skill and uh, quality expectations that comes with that as well. So if we move on to the uh, next one and just look at what an operations analyst could look like, and then we'll contrast it to a senior analyst for analysts. Um, uh, go back to operations analyst, Peter. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so the important attribute when you're you're accountable for operations is disciplined execution and consistent results. You make sure that you know people in these roles are able to, to repeat things the way they are supposed to be. If the need for escalation, they are going through the escalation process rapidly, and they are also keen enough to identify opportunities for additional ongoing improvement. Almost is an entry level role, so they are going to be learning the data, they are going to be learning the systems, their technical capabilities is going to be you know, more for a life cycle. Now compare that to a senior you know, they are not focusing on repeatable tasks, they are actually being given problems to solve. And what is going to be expected from a senior once you give them a problem, they should actually figure out where to find the answers to solve the problem. They should be able to go ahead and find different data sets. They should be able to come up with a different type of algorithms or technology tools. Those are the sets. Um, the statistical analysis is going to be the best way to come up with clusters. Maybe they are going to need to have a combination of, of school and Excel or R and, you know, top load tool is going to matter a lot less, how they approach the problem is going to matter a lot more. And you also see in these you know, slides, and it's going to be a forward length detailed session on these career ladders at Enterprise Data World for those of you interested. Uh, for and for managers, it is important to be able to describe what kind of work would it expect one to be able to do it at a given level. So you see the sample data need or sample data quality need that if it's, I want to be a senior analyst, how do I get promoted? One of my answers should be for the type of problems I need you to be able to own and deliver. The skills you need to display and here are the behaviors. It comes to evolving in our career, uh, and getting to the, the next level, um, I'm to see that we are starting to talk much more about skills and abilities. 
we are talking about years of experience and how much technology you know, someone actually knows. And look, our slide is lagging one slide behind. However, you know, you'll see the full set of content again as part of the description. So, Mamet, just size one of the, the points that you're making is that subtly, I think you're saying, we've already got a data scientist category out there. We've been operating on it for a while, and there are people that have developed these knowledge, skills, and abilities. Now we're trying to articulate it perhaps a bit better. Absolutely, uh, Peter. And if you look at some of the development programs that are evolving because it's just so hot and there are not enough data professionals that can do effective analysis. Uh, there are development programs here in Silicon Valley that will take people who have a hard science background because they already know how to hypothesize hard questions, how to look at data, and they need the additional you know, technical skills. In case they have the ability, but they not have the tools. Seeing some people who have been doing more the traditional data analysis with reporting type tools and then wanting to understand how to get into a higher level of more complex analysis. And then the coaching we provide to them is much more about additional abilities, about being willing to take risk, being able to, you know, fast and you know, recover quickly. These are the phrases I often use. So they're comfortable being able to up with alternative ideas, evaluate them on their merits, and some programs are also evolving, and they are based on the type of work we've been doing for a long, long time. You know, either on analyzing the data, using the high level, controlling it, or you know, focusing on building systems to deal with the data. I fundamentally believe there are six core types of things we've been doing for some time, and that we will continue to do which is what gives us the longevity in this session to be adaptable, even as technology changes. Absolutely. Let me uh, ask you to jump in in just a minute here. I'll, I'll, I'll say some of the work that we've done. And it, one of the things that was so fun to put this together was that Mehmet and Eva had sort of come to their conclusions independently of each other. So we, we kind of, you know, wow, you've got chocolate and I've got peanut butter kind of thing, and then I added sort of maybe the, the s'more in the middle of it, the, the marshmallow stuff, just to completely come up with an unhealthy example on this. But we're looking at the data scientist career as it's been implemented in most organizations, and we find they're about 20% productive. When I talk to these individuals at conferences and things, they say they spend 80% of their time because they don't have the knowledge, skills, and abilities that Mehmet and Eva have described to us so far. And so, you know, basically the organizations throw them into a thing and say, here's a problem that we need you to go solve. And they say, great, where are the knowledge, skills, and abilities that I need in order to put this in place? And, and you know, learning statistics is not going to be helpful if you don't understand how to best manage your data. You're going to be very inefficient at managing that particular process. Any, any comments on that? I, absolutely. I mean, and, again, we need to start building those skills if we want to look at it from a holistic perspective. You know, we start building those skills from a very young age, actually, and, and begin to build, you know, bridge the gaps there between college and and the point where people actually move this level of profession in terms of building underlying skills and and sort of behavioral um, things that can be successful, as Mamet pointed out. And, I'm, and so I'm you're, you're going to – sorry, Eva. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, I'm sure every one of you watched the President's State of the Union every year, um, but two years ago, uh, President Obama actually did mention data management as a career role that was important for transitioning in there. And we, we investigated and said, you know, where did that come from? And it was a group of community colleges, as, as Eva has related to us, that had gotten together and said, this is an important career field. We think we can make a difference here. So it's a community college-based initiative if we can't get the four-level colleges to, to pay attention to this. Anything else on this, or are we transitioning to the, uh, the more senior roles here at this point? No, I think that's great, and I think we're going to probably have many more late-night deep-type conversations on how we evolve our team's people profession in general at the upcoming uh, physical interest, too. Absolutely. As I mentioned, not only do we have a session coming up at the Enterprise Data World Conference on this, but Matt's going to present these de uh, 
these concepts in more detail. We're also going to throw together a birds of a feather session. So if some of you have uh, ideas around this, please please look to that as an opportunity. So this this next portion here, I acknowledge my friend and colleague Ken Shepard, who I've met in the last year and, and become uh, uh, quite good friends with. Uh, he's introduced me to something called levels theory, and the key is, is that it's based on something that um, Elliot Jacks, who put together requisite order, and it sounds a bit academic, but it's actually quite practical. And the analogy that I like to use it, uh, it is that if you're in production research uh, and understanding things, one of the books you may or may not have come across is something called The Goal. And it's a very insightful way of describing the theory of constraints, which actually relates back to um, uh, Rick Hawkins, uh, the selfish gene concept, interestingly enough, but we, we don't have time to go there on this one, uh, on this. But, but requisite principle will look at patterns of language obviously moving from the concrete, very low levels, to higher and higher levels of abstraction. And as Mamet and Eva have both described, looking at the ways in which we expect the various knowledge workers in these situations to approach a problem. And a junior person, we're going to expect them to be closer with techniques, and a more senior person, we're going to be more concerned with looking at problem solution development. This requisite order I'm going to present to you just very, very briefly in this chart. It, it has seven levels, and it starts out at the very bottom with what we call a frontline operator, somebody who is not typically thought of as management, and that they have a very prescribed function, uh, operate this machine, perform this task, interface with these customers. Their planning horizon is really going to be less than a quarter in most instances. The second level up, then, is a line manager, and their focus here is on an operational function that is not as prescribed, but certainly not as vague as we're going to see at the top of the chart. And their planning horizon is a little bit less than a year in this particular situation. Then a director, a department manager, and again here the focus is on evolving the department or optimizing the department with a two-year planning horizon. The fourth level is a VP or a general manager where they're taking care of an entire organizational unit and looking around, in this case, two to five-year planning horizon. Then we get to level five, which is a president, a managing director. They're in charge of a business unit. They have a five to ten-year planning horizon. And executive vice president at level six for a multi-business organization with a ten-year to twenty-year planning horizon and a CEO in a 20-plus year uh, focus on this. And those of you that have read Jack Welsh's material know this is the type of thing that he was thinking about when he finished his career at General Electric. So one of the things that, that did with this material was to try and put together uh, um, a, a set of professional pieces that talk specifically about how would this work in the data management community here. And you can see we've got, again, the front line of sort of a data steward down there at the bottom. These are not hard and fast. And what we're really talking about here are data management management career titles. Now, that's the last thing, of course, we want to confuse the HR directors with. Um, but this is for really making big efforts. And in particular, it's going to apply to larger organizations, the federal government in particular, but again, big IT organizations, smaller IT organizations, they're still going to need combinations of these functions. And we can look to requisite theory to for some guidance in these areas on how, if you have a small IT shop, much less a small data shop, how you can use these, these um, theories in here. So again, a third, a manager, a modeler, the director, the chief data steward, you know, might have a two-year planning horizon here, a deputy CIO in this case, might be a two to five year uh, career field in this. And again, just working our way up to a chief data officer, which we won't have a level seven in our, our thing because data officer is probably always going to report into the C level of the organization somewhere around that. So this presents us with yet again a series of challenges. And, and basically, it's going to be a little harder to get some energy around this because there are a lot more people in smaller shops than there are people in big shops. But if we can help, and particularly as, as Eva did earlier with the work with the labor uh, department, put these into some categories, it provides some advice, some guidance for people who are trying to work.
work on this uh, in here. Some thoughts around that and, and things that we need to do clearly is look at curriculum development and clusters and things like that uh, in, in, in that type of a concept. So Eva, we've talked a lot about these things and, and Mehmet put together a wonderful wordle here for us. Uh, you know, what is happening in the educational career uh, field as you're, you're working towards these? So as you mentioned, and both you and Mehmet have put out, I mean, there's definitely, we need to look at this from a, a path perspective um, in terms of thinking about development capabilities or the competencies um, for people who might eventually want to end up in this field, but also, you know, if you go all the way back to think about developing skills and competencies in high school and, and um, earlier in problem solving that help prepare people for these kinds of jobs. Um, but at last 10 years, um, Data Management Association in particular has been actively involved in, in a profession we are beginning to really to mature as a profession. And you can see that in education, and you can see that in, in credentialing, and those kinds of things that happen in a real profession, really established profession, like a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant. So um, one of the attempts that uh, one area is that DEMA has been involved, has been creating a DEMA curriculum framework. Um, back in 2005, a group of us got together who were uh, mostly transplants from industry education who found that there really wasn't good guidance. Um, you can, can, you can uh, move on to the next slide, Peter, but we'll move through these next few pretty quickly. This was um, done and published um, through, presented at the IS Education Conference and published in the journal. And just ever sad that identifying job clusters. Um, and at that point, we we really um, were the body of knowledge. Now, a recent um, search on the web I just did, um, there are other curriculum models developing. So you can see this one um, that I found based on uh, um, framework for data management curriculum, and it, it's not exactly the same as, as the DEMA framework, but again, different ways of looking at that. The other um, thing that we're seeing is that there are more master's degree programs and certificate programs um, coming up. Um, we mentioned um, community colleges have been uh, um, are a good place for these kinds of things because we have the flexibility to be able to create. Um, develop programs to meet industry needs. Um, a lot of times before your universities have a harder time being nimble and getting um, programs in place. So um, at, as I mentioned earlier at Edmonds, um, uh, I get a grant to work on self-paced programs that are designed for working professionals and um, that lead to a certification. And the CT, the Certified Data Management Professional, is one of the uh, areas we chose to work on, and we'll see how. Um, the other thing we've seen is more online uh, career guidance. I thought this was particularly interested, interesting because um, Dana is specifically um, called a place to go to find out more information about how to become a data management analyst. So um, it it so that we're, this is evidence that um, all the work that we've been done to build the profession with that is starting to fold, is starting to be used, is starting to be recognized, and make its way into those areas that can actually help people find these jobs. Yeah, that, I got a call from the um, uh, federal government recently where they wanted to have a number of CDMP people who had 20 years' experience with the CDMP, and oh. that was a terrific thing, but uh, it's also a physical impossibility since the CDMP has only been around for a couple of years uh, at this point. There are about 1,600 professionals worldwide that have been designated with this. You're talking to two of them on this particular call here. Uh, yeah, so that's quite of interest. I know in the Seattle chapter, we have a lot of, um, a lot of interest. We run two work the year just to get people certified. And um, and so this is area, it, it's growing slowly, but we do have a professional certification, the data management professional. 
it's it is based on the data management um, knowledge, the wheel of knowledge, as, as Peter laid out, that is um, really kind of put a stay in the ground related to what's the scope of data management work and what are the functions and the kinds of things that you need to know in order to be successful, the principles align it. So the knowledge pieces of it, the skills necessary, and, and of course the attributes are the things that the individual who is drawn to this profession brings to, to the table. Um, so find all of the, the exams to the body of knowledge as we're, we're continually finding it. So the data management body of knowledge is currently in um, invent of the second version. You can see that um, we added new functions. The inter integration and interoperability was in response to the data community saying, hey, this is a very important function that we need to call out. And, um, and of course, we've continued to refine um, our data modeling and design um, has really in a refinement of the data development piece. So um, there's a lot of work Pat Kuzli and Deborah Henderson are working on related to um, get, getting the data management body of knowledge um, uh, new version published. We get volunteers who are trying to push this noodle up the hill. And, and one of the reasons we wanted to do this webinar was to hopefully entice some of you that are listening uh, to come and participate. Now we're getting ready to move into the Q&A section here in just a second. But again, just to recap, uh, a couple things that are coming up. Enterprise Data World is, is our conference. It's going to be in Austin this year. Austin's a great music city, and we'll have some music, and hopefully we'll get to see uh, Mehmet, and, uh, Mehmet Dance and uh, Shannon do some singing down there. And uh, you can also, of course, see the other things that are happening at Dataversity here. And we're doing a, a fairly academic-ish conference in late July. You can see it down at the bottom with the Global Organization Design Society here. If these look interesting to you, we'd love to talk to you more about it because we just are very much resource constrained and dependent on the really excellent efforts of people like Mehmet and Eva who have been working with us over the years on this. So back to the top of the hour here, and really this is the part we've been looking forward to. So we've presented a lot of material, but what we'd like to do is, is spend some time and talk to you all about what sort of questions we can say. You know, if it's a question of how do you get involved, reach out to us. That's easy. But more importantly, perhaps, um, you know, let us know what your thoughts are on this. Uh, again, it was an enlightening thing to me to see that Eva and Mehmet had sort of co-evolved in the same direction and, and that we are starting to see some movement around here. So, Megan, we'll, we'll pull back over and see if anybody's tweeting at us or uh, anything else in the way of tossing questions. Peter, thank you, Eva and Mehmet as well. Uh, that was an awesome presentation. It's now time for Q&A. time for you all to ask your questions, so just click on the Q&A. Uh, window feature. It's at the top of your screen. You should be able to submit your questions through that window. Pat, if you come up so we can just jump right into it. Uh, first question is, how and where uh, do you break into the data profession field as a newly college graduate and is not in a non or it is not, and is not in a non IT discipline? I can that. No, that's great. And uh, first of all. We did have library science up there on that, and that was not an intentional slight to library science. They're an obvious group that should come at this. But Mehmet, you do all kinds of hiring of different people, and Eva, you do all sorts of career advising. So Mehmet, why don't you go first, and then I'll let Eva take it. Maybe we should do Eva first, and then Mehmet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I get this question um, almost probably once every couple of weeks now in my current role, but a lot more often in my teaching role. But um, it's that often what I tell people is, is you need to set your eyes on the prize and you know, look at those areas that you're interested in and the, get your foot in the door somewhere. So if you're coming from a business perspective, get um, into a business analyst type of role if or a um, type of role where you're working with data in some way, industry, and really get to know that industry. Um, and then you'll look for opportunities on your job where um, there's an, more and more opportunities to work with data as a data steward, for example, in your area. 
or in um, helping people to analyze uh, reporting reports or do reporting. And, and from there, you find a mentor and you start to you know get involved with DEMA and work and start to gear way into uh, into the profession. And at Data Blueprint, we typically will take on an intern or two each uh, semester just to look for people who have a keen interest in this area. Matt, are you back with us? I am. Uh, I'm admitted. Uh, my part, you, know, you can decide on which function you want to go after or what kind of company you want to go after in order to get your foot in the door. Once you are there, there is so much data everywhere that you can look at you know, what for opportunity you may want to pursue. I started getting paid in the IT field as a help desk rep. I was on level one, level two, that was, you know, the level four escalations eventually. And then, uh, this is many years back, I was fascinated by the type of queries that were coming in. We were running reports, I think it was Randy, uh, we were just switching to at the time, to try to find out why do we get a lot of calls in certain times? And the question I was trying to answer was to improve our processes. And the way I thought to look at it, it was through the, and I made proposals to my supervisor saying, hey, here's the data that I see. And you're working with a spreadsheet at that point, right? Um, so the more generalized answer is, if you for data specific positions versus being company and then going into the data role, start playing with data in whatever medium that is accessible to you. So when you encounter someone looking to hire somebody, give you a good path for your passion, your curiosity, your ability to take risks and make hypotheses, because what is harder to develop people in. And if you were to catch me at an event and make that case, you're absolutely going to have my attention. And even if I don't have something, I can try to you know, touch with someone can. If you want to work for a company and then get involved in data, it's even easier because you have many more opportunities. And find a specific business problem you want to solve or you think that needs to be solved and then improve the way you know it can be managed. I mean, to this date, uh, I engage with my finance partners in my organization as part of the budget I've been responsible for. And one of the first things is, what are the numbers we are trying to manage to? How do we have visibility to it? And how do we ensure that the information is good and it is timely and for it to minimize the risk? Data analysis and data action opportunities everywhere. Matt, it's like you were also talking specifically about the role of mentoring. Eva, I wonder if you have looked at that from the curriculum perspective. I don't know exactly how a mentoring context would fit there, but and, and if we get a flood, we won't be able to mentor everybody, but, but certainly that seems like a, a, an important component. Well, I know what I want to, one of the things that I've done over the past um, years is um, a lot of times I invite the students um, that are interested in pursuing this to our data management chapter, and that's an, a really good opportunity for them to talk with network with people in the profession. And, and often they will find somebody who's interested in mentoring them and or they'll be actively involved in the chapter. And I think that's it's really important for all of the people working in the profession to be willing to reach reach out and help somebody who's interested in, in this because um, a lot of enthusiasm there. <laughs> so mentoring, looking Mehmet up at a meeting and stalking him, I think that was an open invitation for some friendly <laughs> Uh, and again, certainly pay attention to some of the other. Go ahead, Mehmet. I'm see, and yes, I am doing this to promote a conference that helped me be much deeper in my career. But if someone is actually willing to take the time to show up at an event, which is Enterprise Data World or a different conference, and done their homework to actually want to have a productive conversation on here, here's what I'm interested in, where can I go? I would be foolish not to engage with that person because such people are so rare in our field. And who knows what's going to happen. I mean, I'm always trying to step up my team at different levels of experience. You know, I have customers that are trying to hire people in different geographies. So absolutely. Uh, this is 
if you know, if you are doing that, your idea of what you want to do beyond the generic question, and I think find all the answers, which is what I actually coach to you know people in college when I do career programs, when I stop by at career fairs from time to time. Well, well, Megan just passed me a note and said there's a lot of questions. Megan, what's the next one up? Next one is, let me see here, uh, what's the difference between data analytics and data analysis from your perspective? Matt, do you talk more about that? I mean, analysis is the concept of analyzing data, right? And analytics sounds like a particular implemented version of it. You have a data analytics solution through reporting, uh, just like you know, people used to say business intelligence is a reporting tool. Well, like the business intelligence is finding out what is the information needed to drive the business operations more effectively, supported by data technology and processes. It's just answer. But the confusion around that is something that we'll continue to try and address. Uh, I also see analytics as, as, as a bit more tool focused, perhaps, than uh, the analysis part of it. Eva, anything on that one? No, I mean, you, you are, uh, I, I would defer to the Matt on that. Great. Megan, next question. Our next question is Do you have any defined roles and responsibilities for each of the third level of data governance? Professional. Um, I should have one in about two to three weeks. Excellent. Another plug to come see you at the conference or, or look you up on the web uh, on that. He's not hard to find. He's just hard to pin down. <laughs> Something coming. Good. Excellent. Next one, Megan. Okay. Question is: Is metadata management a function of data warehouse BI or data quality? I'm going with neither on that one. Really, I actually would go that one. So one of the things we tell people and where we see projects get in trouble is, is that they're trying to go with more of a single solution on this. So when I look at, at most data warehouses, they fail because they are on uh, trying to do a one-legged stool, and they focus on the data warehousing technology, and the software, of course, works very, very well. But if you put a warehouse in place without a governance and a quality component to it, uh, the quality of the warehouse becomes very, very uh, poor very quickly, and, and it's very difficult to work within that. So, um, you know, I would very definitely see that, that what we really need, again, goes back to Mehmet's comment about holistic thinking. We want people that can put the right governance around this. And the question was specifically about metadata. Here's, here's my answer on that. If you have a data governance group, the language that they should speak is metadata. So mm -hmm. take that and, and run with it, I guess. Yeah. And neither is the question almost sounded like it should belong under one of the buckets. Each of those, as well as application development, have metadata associated with it. So yeah, it's I a would, singular function. I would wholeheartedly agree with that. That was my first reaction too. Is that you know, in, in, if we're dealing with meta, working with metadata at all in all areas of the wheel on the in the body of knowledge, but um, I think that. You know, I know it's one function, and there's a function in terms of managing metadata, um, understanding and working with it is important to data management. Okay, I hope that's through that, uh, Megan. The next question is: We're not seeing much take up of the data analyst title. The engineer does seem to be exploding. What are you seeing? From perspectives, Mehmet is a hiring manager and is somebody who participates in hiring manager activities, among other things that you do. What question of engineer versus analyst? So, um, I'm guessing that's Stephen that asked that question. Hi, Stephen. Pure, <laughs> purely for semantics, um, we are engineering data. I mean, you can write derivation logic, which could be a part of somebody's role. Engineer is someone to mean that builds. And analyst is someone that analyzes. So if you're looking at this purely from a title update perspective, I would look at the job description and I would look at whether the job descriptions are being written accurately or not. Uh, I, I get tapped sometimes internally from other groups and many of my customers trying to figure out how to write things in general and uh, would just say, look at the meaning of the word. 
are important. Uh, I'm still seeing a lot of requests for data analysts. I'm seeing requests for database engineers or software engineers with a data focus. I haven't heard of data engineer as a high trending title, at least in the Bay Area, and that is including attending the data conference for the last three years. Eva, any insight there? Well, I, I think about um, Jack Ackman's, you know, framework in terms of the different roles and, you know, engineer, engineer is, is as a, a place in the total view, but I think that I think the titles that go along with jobs are not necessarily descriptive of what their real role is. And so I, I think we see a lot of um, data, we could put data architect, data analyst, data engineer, data um, evangelist. That's a new one I think we can start. I think that um, part of the work that we all need to do and the challenge is to try to rein in some of these job titles. IIBA is um, also working on similar things with business analysis because they're all over the board and and organizations don't really understand what those roles are. So the more we can provide information um, to help guide that, the better, I, I think. Excellent. And I'll just add in that I agree with Mehmet's focus on title because an analyst analyzes and an engineer engineers, and those are distinct knowledge, skills, and abilities that we need to apply to these things. However, one of the reasons we in the data community have had such trouble um, getting the rest of IT to understand is because IT is not taught architecture and engineering concepts, period. They learn business concepts, they learn computer science concepts, which are distinct from these. And it's very difficult to implement any sort of IT solution without a well-engineered pile of data, if you will, or a well-architected pile of data, and the two have to occur in the same way. An architect is necessary to put in place large, complex initiatives, and engineers are necessary to implement the architectural visions around those. But I'd also agree that, that, that uh, again, we've got to be careful with the title specifically. Megan. Oh, the next question is, how has the role of data scientist been paired with the field of operations research? I'm going to jump in on this one because I've seen uh, in the last five years about 100 universities take their OR and decision science curriculum and rebrand it as a data science curriculum. Um, that, that, I think, may be partly behind what the question is. I think they are similar and uh, certainly complementary but again, let's turn it over to, to Eva, who's really looking at some of those pieces. Eva, how would you look at that? Well, and I'm, you know, I can only see from the perspective of the types of academic programs that are emerging. And um, I, my concern is that um, maybe the scientist is the new hot, you know, term. It's not such a bad thing because it's bringing us to this area. And um, but I, I do, you don't know, you know, whether we've really sorted out exactly what all are. A computer science seems to be the one that's moving toward the data scientist. Um, I think with statistics, you know, a lot of the statistical um, and types of skills in that area. And again, of course, the data seems to be driving a lot of that because there are um, those jobs. There are people we see those as hot jobs. And so I think that yeah, I think it's all good, and eventually we're going to sort it all out. <laughs> Although it will be helpful. Mehmet, any comments on that? Nothing. Data scientists? I've had about the first big data solution into production, you know, plus years ago. So we definitely have them. We use them for different purposes. We use it for operational intelligence. We use it for you know, like intelligence. We use it for internal data quality operations. Um, you know, one of the things you know I've worked on is how to assess the quality in additional the huge image environment with multi-sourcing, not calling it big data per se, and the area of research as also. One of the questions, I mean, I think in the 80s we had quants and operations research really took it from management science perspective. I think fundamental principles are the same. 
and the most that we can do, I'm all for it. More attention will help us get more energy behind it and more people join in the conversation, and uh, hopefully we'll get it sorted out. But I, I also have a problem in particular with the term big data, because every definition I've seen of big data is absolutely not operationalizable. Um, what we can identify big data the techniques and big data technologies, and I'd encourage those of you listening that if somebody comes at you and starts babbling to you about big data, if you can say, can we have a different conversation? Instead of using the term big data, could you use the term big data techniques or big data technologies? Because we can identify those. We can, in fact, put them together. Um, but we absolutely can't identify big data in and of itself, given the current definitions that we have for it. And that okay. That's right. additional challenge we've lived for the last, you know, 30 years, so, right? Big data is a technology approach. Data warehouse is a technology approach. It may absolutely be the best implementation approach to answer the business problems. Coming back to the ability slide that, you know, talked about, we are effective resources for our business, for our customers. If we can help figure out the right questions, and the answer to those questions. And this may not always be 100% up to date, 100% accurate. We need to quantify the currency of the information. We need to quantify the likely accuracy of the information. But this is what we are fundamentally about as data professionals. And we, when we're analyzing that data, we are architecting solutions that integrate and deliver that data. We are making sure that data is being secure and compliant to adhere to our organizational principles details about our individual roles in our organization. Because I don't use the word big data when I talk to any customer about their intelligence needs. And if we happen to report or recommend that how to with various other things, that's what we can talk to the you know the owners about or the sys admins about or the uh, applications about. The point starts with the definition of the business need. Absolutely. Next question. Okay, next question is, as a liberal arts graduate who has many years in the data field, how significant do you think that the current emphasis on STEM is as a preparation for working with data? That was STEM, S-T-E-M? Yep. Okay, so science, technology, engineering, and math, we know we have a big deficit in this country, and we're trying to address that. So there are all sorts of movement around the STEM curriculum. My answer to that is particularly that if you're a knowledge worker, you need to know something about data. Uh, and I'll just give a little shout out to a book that's one of my favorites. It's called The Information by James Glick, who's the guy that introduced, uh, popularized the term yes. chaos uh, in the world. It's a terrific book, and it gives you a little bit of background if you're not as familiar with this area. Um, it'll help somebody who's been in the field to understand sort of the formal definitions and things like that. Uh, again, Eva, comments on this? Well, so, you know, we talked earlier, there are so many different aspects of data. And I think, you know, again, one of the earlier slides we talked about, there's, um, there's the, the technology side of working with data. There's the analytical side of working with data. There's also um, many other types of professions that, um, you know, involve working with people to collect information semantics and, you know, understand the definitions of data. And so, you know, really, I mean, as a liberal arts graduate myself um, as well, um, I feel like those, those, those skills have been incredibly important. The communication skills, the ability to, um, to be able to recognize patterns is something that you learn in other areas as well. So, I, I think that there's room for everybody. I think that the the current trend toward the data scientist is trying to put more of the STEM perspective because there's math involved, there's more understanding from that perspective of scientific problem solving types of skills that you learn in STEM. So I think that um, you really you really come there's a place for you and for your skills, no matter um, what background you have. Um, because there, there's areas where you can apply that. Three daughters, if I recall? Uh, two daughters. Two daughters, there we go. Are they headed for a STEM career? Uh, honestly, my focus 
focus, so they're uh, getting to focus on making decisions effectively, figure out what is it that they want to make a decision on. Uh, older daughter is, you know, have fashion design, she's nine. Uh, uh, her passion interest, and uh, I met another good friend of mine who is in fashion design. I did not realize how much math is actually involved in it because the math of making something work, there is the understanding of the flexibility of different type of fabrics that they have to consider, their dynamics of it. So the of liberal arts, I think, is something, you know, having been an engineering math business major academically, fully understood or appreciated. Another time I've been in my career, I absolutely appreciate the richness of it. Seeing it's about the subject area. Uh, effectiveness, especially when it comes to K-12 education, this is whether it's a bachelor's degree or a liberal arts degree. You wanted to comment on slide 14 too. Yeah, I actually wanted to, you know, bring this in, you know, slide up since we skipped over it fairly quickly. If I was going through that, uh, you know, you heard us. I think with what you are doing in the role and the high level, you know, framework that a phone call we actually came up with uh, in the past is that in the moment of epiphany, fundamentally, we are passionate about one of the things, you know, whether we want to work with data or we like to work with systems. And if you think about your colleagues, they either want to work with data or systems that touch the data. And then that there are different things people like to figure out. You know, some people absolutely love writing code. That's not what I was passionate about. I like figuring out how systems worked. And you know, if you were to look at this chart and look at the top level words, probably two things that you're going to relate a lot more to than the others. So you can think about the type of roles you can be most effective in because you would be following your passion and then you can look at the expectations for the roles that typically fall in that type of it. And since Epiphany, all three of us say we copyright it at once, and then we'll be uh, protected, right? <laughs> 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 Megan, next question. Oh, we have about five or six questions left, so we'll go on to the next one, see how much time we have, and if we don't get to any of them, um, they will be in the follow-up email um, answers. So on to the next one. Uh, next question is, I'm in a BA, BA role in IT group in capital markets. What is your recommendation on how to go about creating standards and processes for data quality and governance where none exists and is not in the current culture? Tim Bach would be a good place to start on that, uh, where we do have a chapter on data quality. I have to apologize. It was the last chapter we put in the Tim Bach, and that was a bad thing on our part because quality should never be last. Uh, on that, but it'll certainly give you a framework for starting to look at resources and different approaches. That is probably more than we can get into here. Quick, Eva, and any other things to point the individual to? I'd actually say pick a problem or opportunity and put focus behind that one. And then find a mentor, you know, tap into that. I'm going to go much more practical in this case. It would be great for personal knowledge if you're trying to make a case, given your role, and try to emphasize it. People are going to need something that's going to resonate for them. I found, you know, unfortunately one of my earlier learnings is the quality of the architecture plans on the knowledge you have doesn't help you to the right initiative if you do not have a sense of urgency to move in direction. Fair point. Any quick comments? I add to that too is that you know as an analyst, I think that is a really important role to begin to um, have conversations about data and the discussions they're having with you know, with the various areas of the organization, and, and you know focusing on on and starting to raise the importance. It's a culture change in a lot of organizations, I think, and you know I'm there too. I understand it's it's something you just you have to start raising awareness and then and then begin to bring in a discipline. I think using some of the tools and the other experts out there in the field. There's a lot of information out there through uh, various channels um, on the web um, and a uh, lot of people in our community that are writing about this. So, you know, 
sort of I was the map pick a problem as focusing it from a data perspective. Great. Megan, next one. Try and speed up here a little bit. Youth and programming are coming back together again. For a while, many programmers seem to treat the data as a black box. So I think the answer to that is no. And I'm just going to say my experience is that people are really interested in making programming faster, looking at very interesting methods around agile and things. And the way to speed those up is to take the data out of it. Don't let those things start unless they fully understand the data requirements. You'll be amazed at the difference that makes. I unfortunately agree with Peter, and I think there are two reasons for it. Uh, people hearing more about data, and the push for data is coming from uh, lines of business more than uh, technology and IT. And think about a lot of people that are in IT management positions. You know, many of them came from the traditional infrastructure or application development background versus data background. I think it is going to be a slower transition. Now, back to the transition to occur, and I think what's going to happen is people are going to start realizing who's being successful, and they are being more successful. And if we end up having more conference sessions on the positive deviance, I think we will see a bigger mind shift. Uh, that, that if I'm brought into a conversation at a customer site and they want to understand how to make it work, they typically ask the question, who has done this well? And they look at other examples of where is something working better to hold up a benchmark. Now, that you mentioned specifically starting to report results. And of course, that's one of the things we're all looking for. Where can we put in some A and B experiments? If your organization has multiple implementation projects going on, you can try some one way and some another way, and then come back to us and tell us collectively as a community what has worked and what hasn't worked. And that's been a piece that hasn't been an area of research uh, in that, that thing. And I think that's something that we could all benefit from. Uh, just got a quick note, Shannon. She said we can keep going because there's still a bunch of questions on this. So Megan, next question. The next question is, uh, do you view the skill of logical data modeling as a distinct skill set, or can it be done just as well by BA, DBA, or data analysis? Uh, analysis sorry. <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to jump in on that one and say, first of all, the the title of the person who does the work uh, is, is not related to the quality of the effort that comes out of it. And we've seen lots of these things where people will actually invent data modeling on their own and come up with it. Um, if you're interested, and this is a deep topic, uh, one of our all favorite people here, Graham Simpson, did his PhD dissertation research around that very question and published it in a book. And I'm looking on my shelf right now to see if I can find the title. Um, if you look him up on Amazon, you'll see he's Graham Simpson, and he also has a popular novel. He's changed careers now uh, on that. But anyway, that's a very, very deep dive into that, that specific question. But again, Eva and Mehmet, what do you guys think? Oh, first of all, I have to say that. So I learned data modeling back in um, the early 90s when I was EDS. And that skill, once I had that skill, that skill has served me through, I mean, I continue to refine and, and improve. I mean, it's, it's not something that, that you you know. I mean, it's something you're constantly practicing. But I've used it in so many different contexts as a business analyst, as, as a, you know, just ch just to help me understand a problem or help other people understand a problem. It, you know, people who know me know that I'll start drawing up on the board. And um, it, it, I do think it's a, it, it's a skill that you can use, you know, all different areas and in many different areas. Uh, no, I mean, it is a skill uh, versus a role. I think the effective business analyst, you should be familiar with how to understand information requirements. Absolutely, to me, that is a must-have. If you can then take that and put it in a model that's going to be effective based on the consumption or storage needs, that's great. To me, the modeler is a profession, is someone who does that primarily, but expect the data modeler to be able to gather business requirements, do some basic data analysis, understand the system implications of their models, the more senior they become also. Maybe that question one more time just to make sure we did address it. Um, I find that the technicians list DA or data analysts. Wait, wait, that's not it. I'm sorry. 
Right yeah. ahead. <laughs> Not that jet lagged. Sarah, do you view the skill of logical data modeling as a distinct skill set, or can it be done just as well by EA, DBA, or data analyst? So I think I think the answer to that was resoundingly yes from the three of us then. Yes, I do think that understanding the difference between physical modeling, a logical model, and, and modeling a physical database structure is important. And I found that uh, dangerous. <laughs> and, and you know, and and, and so I think that you know, understanding the difference and using logical modeling um, is important um, if you're in any of those roles. Great, Christian, Megan. Okay, I actually, just have one more. Um, if, how are the roles expressed in this presentation determined as roles is managed under technology or business? <laughs> so that yes. What do you put into? You. So I actually report into a group called Customer Flex. With a, at the executive level, this is the group that is accountable for ensuring customer adoption of Salesforce technologies. Company with a different, you know, perhaps different model than many other technology providers that after one buys the product, then there is still continuous engagement uh, because we want them to, you know, use it, get the return of investment out of what they got. And, uh, you know, sometimes it is you know, adding more services to it. Sometimes it is understanding what our best practices. Sometimes it's training. We have a holistic engagement model. My latest role is, you know, building up a data-centric consulting organization because we saw such demand in this particular field. And um, it is, you know, making sure we understand the customer's Definition of success. You have a business school, a computer science school, and none of the above, and all of the above. How are you teaching? <laughs> yeah, all of the above. When I was teaching, it was in general in the uh, computer information systems. Uh, I'm now the direct IT director for the college and e-learning. So, um, so I am. I'm actually practicing. You know, we're doing a lot of data management uh, to work at with a college and at, along among community colleges in the state. So this, um, you know, it's IT, um, but it, it typically, I think it depends on, and this is the whole topic, I think there's the, the capability maturity model of your organization makes a big difference, I think, in how people view and where people view data. So um, I think that uh, that makes, you know, where, it falls in an organization has a lot to do with how um, the organization or industry, I think, sees these input data. And one of the reasons Eva was giving, because she knows I have very strong opinions on this, I believe firmly that data should be treated as an asset and managed at the same level of organizational assets as the other assets of an organization, be they physical assets, be they human assets, lots of other types of assets that are reporting in, and that IT has not been well uh, suited to implement data, and again, it's, it's because of a lot of the reasons that we've talked about here. People don't know what they don't know, so they assume what we taught them in college and university for the past 30 years is that data engineering, excuse me, data design and building and construction and engineering is a technical skill that belongs in the bowels of IT, and I have some research that we've published that shows it's getting pushed further and further away from the top levels of the organization. So consequently, people don't have an understanding of how it needs to be used and leveraged in these concepts. Uh, so in my mind, it is absolutely a business function, and I want to do that to correct and to help organizations obtain a strategic competitive advantage in the long run. And I'm seeing that is working in most organizations. Again, we will have conversations around that at EDW in particular. Uh, they're running a chief data officer event there that will be very, very interesting to see how those pieces are coming together. We'll be presenting some new research that we've put together uh, as well. Uh, and again, if you want to read more on that, I've got a book out on the topic called The Case for the Chief Data Officer. So, Megan, that's the last question. That's it. So I do want to thank Eva and Mehmet because you both put in weekends and nights on this, uh, including last night, Mehmet in particular. Uh, so while I was flying back 
from San Diego. He was working on some of the, the final refinements of the slides here. But this has been just, from my perspective, a really, really valuable contribution here. And I want to thank you guys for taking the time to do this. And, of course, Shannon for letting us uh, present these ideas, because it's not often you can go to a, a source like this and say, hey, we will talk about something that hasn't been talked about a lot before. And uh, data diversity has just been wonderful in that sense to, to work with over the years. Well, Ben, just a great presentation, you guys. This is just so engaging. Everyone's really been involved, and thanks to the attendees who hung in there over the time. It's just been uh, fast, and, and we're always proud to have such engaged attendees and uh, who can uh, can conversation. Um, we'll look forward to carrying on at the conferences then, right? Exactly. <laughs> we look forward to it, and uh, you know, as, as Popular questions, of course, is if um, we will be sending, we'll be sending out slides. We'll send, I'll send a follow-up email within two business days, so by end of day Monday, containing links to the slides, links to the recording, and anything else requested throughout the webinar. I know the DM box was mentioned many times. That's of course available in our Dataversity bookstore. Uh, and Mehmet and Eva, if you want to get Megan your uh, any information to share for your blogs and so on and so forth, we'll get that out to everyone as well. That was mentioned. Uh, and so thanks, everyone, for this great presentation. I hope everyone has a fabulous day. Thanks for this go long, Shannon. Um, it was, it was, it, there was no way we, we could stop it. It was just too good of a conversation. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, we'll talk next time then. Thanks so much. Thanks. Eva, thank you very much. Thank you.